guys, welcome to another episode of Anderton's TV. My very special guest today is Yvette Young, all the way from California, spending a few days in the UK and Europe, touring, doing some clinics. Mm -hmm. um, and you probably just heard some of, you know, your kind of unique playing style, tapping, uh, different time signatures, some pretty complex stuff. And I'm intrigued to know how, I know a little bit about you in terms of your a fine art graduate, piano player, came to the guitar after the piano. And I think I can definitely hear kind of how that's influenced you. But tell us, tell us about how you, you know, what was it about music when you were growing up that made you want to, you know, take up the piano? Um, that's actually a funny question because um, I grew up playing classical music and I played piano and violin, uh, played in a couple of orchestras and uh, I was a competitive pianist for a while. Which sounds really funny because <laughs> I don't think music should be a composition. But <clears throat> I guess to my point, I, I actually really hated music growing okay. up. Like, it was kind of something that was like pushed on me by my parents. Um, in retrospect now, I'm super grateful because it's given me a lot of skills like my ear and like finger dexterity. Um, but back then as a kid, I just, I just wanted to play video games or I just wanted to go out and like, I don't know. How young were you when you first started playing <laughs> piano? Uh, I was four. Yeah. So um, it was really intense. I would have to practice for like four hours every day on top of homework and stuff. So um, there goes my childhood. <laughs> um, what was but it, yeah. Why were your parents pushing you? Are they, are they musicians or are they just um, my, competitive my, kind of nature or something? My, my mom and my dad actually both played accordion. My dad mm -hmm. still plays accordion. Um, my dad composes music and he worked as a piano salesman, piano technician. Uh, and I think everyone in my family, like my cousins and stuff, they're all like really amazing piano players. Um, my cousin Clara Rule, she's like, uh, now she's a uh, piano teacher at UNC. Um, okay. But yeah, I guess I was just supposed to follow in the footsteps of everyone. And I really didn't like, I guess, playing music under pressure. Even in orchestra, I think I didn't... I didn't really even derive joy from playing other people's music, like having someone tell you how a piece should be interpreted. Like, for instance, Baroque music, there's all these rules, like you have to play it very stoically, no emotion, no pedal. Like for me, that was always kind of a huge bummer because I wanted to like put emotion in a box. But uh, yeah, I guess like it wasn't really fun and it actually made me sick for a bit, um, just from all the pressure of having to compete and having to like, you know, just live up to this high standard. Mm. Um, and when I was in the hospital, I actually taught myself how to play guitar. And oh, it was like a really fun way to... So you're, um, to, you're talking really, uh, just a mental breakdown kind of thing, was it about the amount of pressure on you to, to, to get to a certain level of pan piano? Yeah, it was, I, I feel like it was a lot of internalized perfectionism right. from growing up. Like I had to get like really perfect grades as well. So it was just a lot of pressure for a little kid. And yeah. um, I I had an eating disorder. So that's actually what and right. ended up putting me in the hospital because my heart stopped working. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, when I was in the hospital, I, I, I already listened to a lot of bands. Like I really liked Radiohead back then. And then I liked a lot of folk music like Cat Stevens and... Um, Sufjan Stevens, all the Stevens. <laughs> um, <laughs> Shaking Stevens? <laughs> yeah. That's probably, Never heard of it. <laughs> no, it's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I kind of just started like learning stuff by ear in the hospital. And then I was like, wait a minute, I can, I can do this myself. So I started writing music, um, just using my ear, just using like things I learned from other people's songs. And that proved to be a really great source of therapy for me. And um, I think I rediscovered my passion for music just by teaching myself guitar and like learning music on my own terms. Mm. And then for me, even to this day, like I just really detest competitiveness. I think it kills like the fun <laughs> for doing something. I think it it makes you kind of uh, put boundaries on yourself. Um, so yeah, these days are like- you, Are you still internally <laughs> competitive? I know, I know what you mean about the, I'm not sure if competitive is quite the correct kind of, you know, w word. I, 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 don't, I totally agree that talking about this guitar player is being better than that guitar mm -hmm. player. Or, I hate all that as well. Yeah. But I think there's an internal sort of, you want to get better. Yeah. Right? So I'd there's... I'm competitive myself. Mm. Like, I know that I have, like, really high standards for myself. And um, 
I think everyone's different also. Some people maybe might, might benefit from like having, um, you know, like a fire under their ass. But for me, I think like whenever I started just comparing myself to other people, it just kind of bring back my traumatic childhood and mm. also um, just make it so that I'm not focused on um, myself and like, I'm not appreciative of like what, are, what I, I can do already. Mm. So it's like my rule is like always grow, always develop, always challenge yourself, but um, don't make it about anyone else. Like music is something that I just do for yeah. myself. So when you um, started to t teach yourself to play the guitar, did you go through a conventional, <laughs> you know, you learned an E chord and an A chord and you started putting them together or did you, were you immediately trying to sort of transpose what you could hear in your head on the keyboard or what you could play on the keyboard onto the guitar? So I think that's where my ear training really uh, helped me and benefited me. So one thing that I did do as a classical musician was I learned music theory. Um, but it's funny, when I write, I actually don't really think about theory at all. I don't count. I don't like think, oh, like this chord will go well with this chord. Like I just purely use my ear and I sing mm. a lot of my melodies. Um, I think ear training helps me be able to translate an idea in my head. <clears throat> Maybe sometimes like I'll sing it with my voice first and I'll be able to like right. relatively immediately play it, which is definitely something ear training will help you with because it'll help you recognize intervals and the distance you need mm -hmm. to travel. Um, and also hearing harmonies and like polyphony. I feel like that's something that is, is playing a Baroque music especially helped me because there's so much counterpoint, so many voices going on. And I definitely feel like when I'm playing the, the, the Reason I can write stuff with multiple voices just because I have that already internalized. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess like when I sit down, I just kind of like hum and sing a bunch of stuff and find the notes yeah. painstakingly. Well, and that because that I I was saying before the before we started, one of the <coughs> when I, uh, Guthrie Govan was on uh, the show a, a few years ago now, and he was saying that again when you look at the chords that you typically play on a piano, you can play two notes side by side if you want to on a, on a piano, you know, just a semitone apart. Or, and of course on a guitar, if you're just gonna play with one hand, that's next to impossible unless you've got a, like a, you know, 10 inch stretch from, you know, from one end to the other. But yeah. that's why you've gone, I, I'm get, is that why you think you were drawn to sort of, to, to, to sort of use this double handed uh, tapping technique so that you could play those intervals and chords that you can hear on the piano? Yeah, I definitely think um, I started out writing music just as a solo guitar player just in my bedroom, actually. Um, and I didn't have a band at the time, so I had to think about how do I sound as full as possible as just like one person? Mm -hmm. How do I give the illusion that there's like a bass part going on, like an implied yeah. built-in bass line um, for all these melodies? And tapping is a really great way to achieve that. And furthermore, <clears throat> we can... Uh, we talked about it a bit earlier, but open tunings, like yes. they really make certain shapes more convenient. Um, so I have some tunings where I literally have an octave so I can like do slides of the same mm. note and it sounds like fuller. Um, pedals also help, like I have a bass octave pedal on my, um, yep. on my home board and it's really great for widening I, I, the sound. I, I loved your approach to, to tunings because for, for me, I think of open tunings and I think of, traditional, um, you know, dad, gad or open G or whatever. And I, I think of a tuning um, that might work for slide or something like that. But you, your approach to tuning is to just tune it to whatever you want it to be to make the, 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 the chord or the, 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 the intervals that you want, you know, because I, I even said to you, so what, what do you call that tuning? It's like, I don't know, it's just these are the six notes I've tuned it to to get to get the sound that I want. So was that something, did that, did you just do that without even thinking about it? Or was that, you know, did you follow another guitar player that had maybe, you know, had an approach like that? So um, I started out playing standard um, and then I listened to a lot of music back then, namely like bands like American Football or this Japanese band called Toe. And um, they, those bands are the ones that introduced me to open tunings, some of which I use today still, like FACGBE or FACGCE. Like um, those two tunings are um, some of my favorites. And I guess once I learned their music and that tuning, I was like, wait a minute, I can write stuff like this as well. And nowadays, um, I actually have a bunch of different tunings I work mm. in. But uh, one thing I do is, 
if I ever get in a rut, like I feel like I just am playing the same sounding thing over and over again. Um, if I'm just too comfortable with certain shapes in a tuning, I'll just um, change one of the strings and I'll make it so that I can't depend on what's comfortable anymore and I'll actually still have to use my ear to find what I actually wanna play. Like when I write, I never wanna make it something where it's like, I'm only writing what's convenient. I always wanna push myself to write what I actually wanna hear. And then even if it's impossible, I feel like anything's possible with muscle memory. If you do it a thousand times, <laughs> you'll get it. I think it's such a, it's such a sort of refreshing uh, approach to, um, and I'd never, I'd never even really thought about just the idea of, of um, changing the tuning. I've, someone said to me once, you know, just if you're playing licks and stuff, you know, absolutely don't get stuck in that rut. Change a note at the end of each lick. Do something to just change. But yeah, just changing the <laughs> tuning and stuff. And and then are you does that um, does that background in you know sort of the music theory? Do you know? Are you, are you sort of able to go, you know what, I'm gonna change the tuning to this, or is it very experimental? Is it just like, I'll just see what happens if I um, change the tunings? I'd say it's like half and half, because mm -hmm. I know what sounds good. I know like, you know, what's uh, in a certain scale and what will sound good. Um, sometimes I'll, purp I'll purposely throw in like a diminished interval or something, just because it's like, if I write something that's like always too happy and major, <laughs> throwing in that weird string for some reason just makes me write stuff that's moodier and like yeah. a, a little bit, um, like I guess like in a minor key. So sometimes it's weird, like just like effects, I feel like certain tunings can like color what you write. I always explain it to people like when you have a nice open tuning, like, you know, it's kind of like a, having a pre-worked canvas. Yeah. Like, there's already a little bit of color there. So whatever you write is going to be yeah. based off of the pre-existing color. Even that strum that you did there, it evoked a feeling. Mm -hmm. As soon as you, it's like, ooh. You know, like, whereas I think standard tuning, you strum it. It, is, it just sounds like a guitar that isn't a chord. You know, it's just like, it's just, a, it's yeah. just doesn't really make any, doesn't make me feel a certain way. But I, I can see what you, <laughs> I can see where you're going with that. We, we, we were talking a little bit, I'm kind of, fascinated by how you're this really interesting melting pot of obviously a you know a highly educated pianist fine art graduate as well so you're obviously it's not just your ears it's your eyes as well that's you know stimulated by seeing things and then you've kind of somehow managed to sort of mash all this together in the guitar and using effects <laughs> as well to just sort of create soundscapes in in a way that we were talking about you know, a little bit of King, King Crimson and stuff and the way uh, Robert Fripp talks about creating soundscapes. And I'm just interested, like in your brain, what's going, you know, are you, are you, are you sort of like hearing colors or whatever they talk about, you know, <laughs> you know, when you, that, I can't remember what that. Synesthesia. That's the word, yes. <laughs> is that, is that, is that what's going on in, in your brain when, when you're writing and playing? So I, I don't think I have synesthesia, but okay, it's funny because um, one of the reasons I got into songwriting was because I really enjoy telling stories with sound, you know, like I, my, my goal as a songwriter is to evoke a, a motion, an emotion or a mood or um, like my favorite compliment uh, to get at shows is when someone says, hey, that second song, it, it made me feel really like, you know, uh, ambivalent. It made me feel uneasy and like kind of like. I was going crazy. I'm like, good, that's like what I wanted. Okay. Like, you know, so when my, my purpose aligns with like what people actually hear, um, I really enjoy that. And uh, I guess the way I view effects, um, I write everything completely dry. Like when I, when I am writing a song, I don't even go through compression because I don't want to like coast on yeah. compression too much. I kind of want to be able to play it without any effects because sometimes live you'll end up having to do that anyway if your board crops out. Um, and then once I have the melody, I'll kind of decide, like, it's like, for me, that's like a black and white drawing. Like, that's like the line art of something. And then you go in to enhance whatever the melody is with effects. Like, they're like colors that you strategically imply, apply in certain areas to enhance the overall picture you're trying to paint. So, you know, like, if I write something, I'm like, this sounds very ethereal. I'll slap on some modulated reverb or, like, um, you know, if I want something to sound kind of like dated, I'll throw a really like nice spring reverb and then like a chorus on it. You know, it's kind of just like, I started out doing it trial and error and seeing mm -hmm. like what effects sounded good. And I, I kind of have my, my 
sonic palette going now. So when I'm at home, it's really fun to go th go through and like figure out what I want for each section of the song. That's great. Have you are you like uh, I don't know if you did you ever, you ever see that um, movie? It might get loud with the Edge and Jack White and um, Jimmy Page in it. You seen that one? No. Anyway, <laughs> they're in the Edge's studio, and it's like every effect ever in the you know and he's just like yeah and, and he's like i've got a so i have a sound in my head of what it is yeah and i and i kind of i know the i don't know it could be very simple like just three notes that are in that sound mm -hmm. and then and then i have to go and find the effect yeah. to, to make that sound is that is that the journey that you kind of you take that bare song and you sort of go yeah these are the these are the notes but it's not the soundscape that i want to create and then it's off you go on that journey. Yeah, it's a lot of swapping out um, different effects to see, like even like something as simple as an overdrive, like sometimes you get ones that are like a little bit growlier, you know, mm -hmm. like, so it's like finding the right tone that you want for this section. And yeah. it's, it's difficult because like as a songwriter, I can't really translate these things with words. I feel like it's all in my head. So I have to be the one going through my arsenal of effects to figure out which one is the most appropriate. I'm just, I know we're gonna sort of, nerd out on on effects and stuff and i was going to do that towards the end but i i quite now seems like an appropriate time for me it would seem like if you had a digital um multi-effects unit you know helix or fractal or whatever you'd have tons and tons of stuff in there to, to to go and experiment with but do you need that much more tactile do you just need to be able to go no i want the knobs on the chorus pedal and if i've got to go through menus to find it it sort of spoils the experience of finding the tone. I mean, I'm just wondering why you've kind of stuck with pedals as opposed to gone going digital. I think like I've, I've always, a lot of the bands I listen to are just like full analog people. And then um, I just started collecting pedals when I was in college. And it's just something that's familiar and kind of fun for me. Like I do like being able to turn a knob. I love tapping in tempos. It's kind yeah. of like dancing live. Like for me, that's <laughs> part of the fun. Like when you're on a stage, you're a performer. So I like having everyone see that these things are things that I have to like manually manipulate to achieve. It's not something that's like program. Yeah. I think at a certain level, it's really useful to have things are programmed, especially if you have to engage like three effects at once, like, yeah. you know, other than growing a radioactive third leg, that's going to be really <laughs> difficult. So um, maybe technology in the future will allow that. But for now, I, I kind of like, um, you know, just even like Sometimes when I'm playing live, I'll like twist a knob with my foot. Right. Like I'll do like um, a live loop and then I'll, I'll fade it out with like my foot. And it's just, it's just fun, you know, and it's people in the crowd are usually like, whoa, that's crazy. You should um, <laughs> go, and, go and look out a, 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 a guy, a website of a product called Gig Rig. Cause he's, he's kind of, he does, does switching mm -hmm. solutions and stuff. Yeah. And I know he had a, he invented a, like a mechanical thing that would go over the top of a, of a knob of a pedal. And then you could press a button and it would and then and it would mechanically adjust the knob one way and then wow. you could press a button and it would mechanically adjust it the other way. It was like I guess super cool. I'm here living in prehistoric times. I didn't even realize <laughs> such technology was available. <laughs> it's very, very cool. Um, um we we talked as well about you changing as a songwriter <laughs> from your initial initially what you were writing was perhaps written for its complexity and its difficulty and how as time goes by you're moving towards things that perhaps evoke emotions through melody rather than through complexity is yeah. that sort of fair to to say i mean how how is that can you talk a little bit about about that yeah i can definitely i think i can trace it to two main reasons why i used to be more concerned with Technique is, I think when I burst on the scene, I felt like I was like, you know, the newbie and I, I felt like I had something to prove or something. Right. So I was like, check it out. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> I felt like, especially, I guess, um, I don't know, like, I don't want to talk about gender too much, but like, even as a girl, sometimes people assume that like, you know, you're just going to play like a couple of chords and like sing a song or something. Right. There's nothing wrong with that also, but I felt like just like, as a guitarist, I was like, oh man, I gotta like flex right now. So yeah. <laughs> I started playing stuff that was really technical and intricate. Um, it's also just how my brain works is like, I'm super detail oriented. So I always wanted to have like a billion built-in parts and harmonies. 
And as I mentioned earlier, I was just a solo guitarist. So sometimes out of necessity, I had to write something really complex because I don't mm. have a band with me. It's just like me and my guitar, <laughs> you know? Um, and then I think something really changed when I started playing in a band and then when I started playing live is I realized I just, I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy having to concentrate the whole time on stage. Like when you're touring for a month mm. and a half and every night you're sweating bullets like, oh, I better nail that run. If I don't nail that run, I'm a, I'm a failure. Like, you know, it's just, it's not yeah. fun anymore. And, and again, part of being a performer isn't just standing there really static playing. It's like feeling the music, you know. Um, I wonder if that's a YouTube transition into playing live, you know, where you've got the sort of comfort on YouTube to just go, I can make this as complicated as possible, mm -hmm. shoot it a hundred times before I put yeah. the video up and then, but live, it's like, I've got one chance to get this right. Mm -hmm. um, so that you're just sort of consciously going, I need to move away from making everything as difficult as it could possibly be. That and, and, and like, it's just fun to rock out and just play some like, chordy section sometimes. I feel like also one thing about technicality um, and intricacy is it loses its effect after a while. I feel like it's most effective when you contrast it with sections that are like more open or like more ambient. Right. And that's something I really admire about like, I, I don't know, like just in good songwriting. It's like you don't just have one texture. You have like a bunch of different textures and they all like accentuate each other. In addition to that, like I purposely in my song started leaving sections out that are like, I guess like started leaving more open sections so that my bass player could play something more melodic mm -hmm. um, and my drummer could do like a solo. So I started thinking about uh, me and my bandmates as a, as a cohesive unit and we fill in each other's blanks. Yeah. And I think that's way more gratifying than, okay, you guys follow my every 16th no you know what i yeah. mean like <laughs> i think it's it's more fun that that seems to be something i think in all songwriters that as they get older their approach becomes about less not more yeah isn't less it? Is you know it, it, so but it's like it's like a yeah. like a benjamin button effect isn't it it's like it's it's the, it's like when they're new it's everything's more and then it's like they're kind of the more mature they get as a songwriter it becomes yeah more about less if that's even a yeah. Even a, a word. How, how I like to explain technique and my viewpoint about like why technique is valuable and important is it's like as an artist, I'm going to talk about being an, a, a visual artist. Yeah, it, do. It's my mother tongue. But um, you want to have like a big toolkit, right? So technique is like basically your arsenal of tools. Um, and I feel like as an artist, you want the biggest toolkit possible so that you can translate all your ideas most effectively. So like, you know, if sweeping, tapping, like, you know, doing bends, like all of these things are things you can use to write a song. But you don't want to use all your tools at once in a song because that can sound kind of cluttered. So it's like, for me, a technique is only as valuable as how much it serves what you're trying to convey. So it's like, if I need to do like a crazy tap run, I'll do it because mm. that's what I wanted for that section. That's the only way I can play what I hear in my head. But it's not like I'm gonna go and like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like when people start out tapping, they'll like do something that absolutely doesn't need to be tapped. Like you can easily just pick it. So it's, and, but there's also sometimes tapping is like more percussive and staccato, mm -hmm. which is nice. So if you're considering timbre, I think that's also a valid argument. Anyways, tangent aside, um, for me, <laughs> I think technique is, is valuable because it's like, then you have like a wider language to draw sure. from. Sure, yeah. Who, who do you, who do you look to now as a as a songwriter, or, or well, maybe just more as a songwriter rather than a guitar player? And and again, we could go back hundreds of years into classical origins, or we could stay contemporary. But who do you look to and just go? They they had something special about them, or have something special about them. They they nail what you would consider to be the ultimate song. I actually listen to a lot of movie soundtrack artists. Mm -hmm. um, I love dynamics. I just love like anything that can make you- That's the emotive, you like that. <laughs> emotive, yeah. I love it. I'm just an emo girl at heart. <laughs> um, I really enjoy Olaf Arnold. I think everything he arranges is just so like heart-wrenching. I enjoy that. Um, and a pianist I really like, he's also a composer, um, Ryuchi Sakamoto. He right. is so good at like tension, like he, will introduce dissonance in a really uncomfortable way. I think I, but he like just like 
resolves it eventually, but it like really like makes you feel uneasy. Um, and I think, I don't know, I, I really admire that because I am uncomfortable with dissonance sometimes and mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable with that tension. And for me, he's someone who like, in his songwriting and his compositions, like pushes it and like lets it sit there for a really long time. And that's something I want to attempt one day. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? We, again, we talked about before the, the, the we were rolling about just analogies between music and food and just like, you know, pop music being hamburgers and certain pieces of music being terribly complex dishes with hundreds yeah. of herbs and spices and stuff in there like yeah. that. And you made it, you made it, a, 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 an interesting point that that's fine. You know, it's fine to have hamburgers one day and it's fine to have a complex meal the next, but your, your worry is that um, large parts of society nowadays will only ever eat hamburger, which is probably true yeah. in, in food as well as music, <laughs> which is yeah. just as bad. But t tell us a bit about how you, you know, what, where do you go? You know, if, you, if, you, if somebody just stumbles across this, video and maybe they go, oh, God, I like what she's got to say. Where, how do you break out of just listening to mainstream? Where do, you, where do you go? Where do you find it? So I think when I was in college, I used to procrastinate just by going on music forums and looking up new bands. Um, and that was kind of like, I don't know, I was somewhat obsessed with the idea. That one day I just woke up as like, there are so many bands out there. There's so much music and I'm not going to be able to hear all of it mm. so I just like for some reason I became fixated on that and I was just like I want to know all the bands <laughs> like right so I, I went and, and like actively sought that out but I think um I think it's like a lot of your average listener I mean I don't want to generalize I'm not an expert on this but I feel like most people I meet who aren't musicians tend to listen to things quite passively and they don't tend to go seek out new music it's like more like what's already available what's like within arm within mm. arm's reach figuratively. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people just turn on the radio and they drive. And then what you hear on the radio is like, for the most part, like, you know, it's written by the same, like four <laughs> Swedish producers. And it's like, you know, like four, four, like the same uh, formulaic chords. Yep. And I think people can get really accustomed to hearing that. And then when they hear something that's like out of that, it's like very startling and, and maybe they don't like it at mm. first because it's new. Like, an uh, example of that is microtonal music. Like in our culture, I don't think we really have as much of it no. going on. But like if you go to the Middle East or something, yeah. like it's everywhere. So people are super accustomed to hearing um, a microtonal scale. Like, you know, like it's, it's really interesting. So I feel like one, um, it's not the primary reason I write, but one thing I really enjoy doing is like, I always tell people I like to sneak in like compound meters and like um, mathy stuff like vegetables to people. So I want them to listen to it, be able to dance and think it's catchy and then not realize that they're listening to something that's like alternating five and seven or something. Like I kind of like just sneaking in there and then later when you really reverse engineer it, you realize that it's, it's quite complicated. It's a bunch of different meters. You, you, oh, you were saying again before that you're not even particularly aware of the time signature that you're that you've written a song in mm -hmm. until one of the other members of the band or the drummer you've asked to play on it kind of goes, "You guys, this is like kind of this and then this and then this <laughs> and then this." So how do you? I mean, if it's not if it's not conscious, how do you kind of just remember how to play it the same every time? <laughs> You know, I, I really do think that, um, I guess my point is exposure. When I was little, I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. Right. Um, some classical, like, contemporary music, like Shostakovich, like, his stuff is insane. It's just, like, all over the place, disjointed, like, there's no flow. Um, I, I grew up, like, having to learn music like that, so... And I grew up listening to a lot of prog, a lot of, like, math rock, a lot of just stuff that was already odd meters. So for me, it was already a part of my lexicon, like, when I, uh, when I started out playing. And I think when I started writing music on my own, I was already really comfortable with those mm -hmm. time signature shifts and, and stuff like that. So when I write, I, I just sing stuff. Um, I like things to be like a sentence, you know? And I think sentences aren't, aren't always like this. They don't always, like, you know, they mm -hmm. kind of have a flow to it. So I kind of want my melodies to do the same thing. Um, wax and wane like human speech. And then, uh, yeah, later when I bring it to my band, sometimes I'm like, 
I'm pretty sure this is in four. And then my drummer will play. He's like, nah, this is not in four. You're, you're like a musical Stephen Hawkins. It's, free, <laughs> it's, it's slightly freaking me out a bit here. Just like how much musical encyclopedic knowledge has obviously gone into your brain. And I know, you know, there's a, I have that, I have a real, um, I think you, the, the way your parents pushed you to, to learn has made you what you you are ultimately and and i have this real uncomfortable because i don't like hearing about (laughs) i don't you know i don't like hearing about you know kids that have been really pushed hard whatever the Mm -hmm. whether it's music or 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 dance or sport or anything like that because it does i think you know there's something it does take away something maybe magical about childhood that you that should you know should be there for all children but what it does produce at the end of it are just unbelievably talented people within oh. that field, you know. So it's a bit kind of, you can't yeah. really have one without the other, you know. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, uh, but it is a bit, so it's kind of scary. We should, I think we'll just go on to way more superficial stuff, like yeah. how cool your sparkly well, green guitar is. <laughs> I will say on that note, I want to, I really want to drive home. I think my story is a really happy story because... Um, I mean, I don't mind getting personal. I think sure. it's important. I think people should learn that, like, their art, their favorite artists, or um, you know, people that they hear go through struggles as well. Um, yeah, like my hospitalization. I think it did really great things for me. It, it improved my relationships with my family because we all realized what was important. And then also in music, because I took up guitar and I taught myself something. I, I felt I developed new confidence because I taught myself a new skill. And then also um, I fell back in love with it. And now I love piano and I love violin. And I'm so, so, so grateful for, I guess, how rigorous my upbringing was with the classical classical music. Because I think, uh, you know, now I can write a song and if I need violin, I can just play it myself. If I need piano, I just play it myself, you know. Um, and it also gave me the discipline to yeah. write, like, really complex music and practice it. Like I can sit there for five hours and just do the same thing. Right. Which is how I used to learn concertos that were like 30 minutes long. I just play the same thing forever. So I think that discipline I'm really grateful for. For sure. As an adult, it's kind of hard to like I, I mean, look, you kind of seem, I've not known, I've only known you for like half an hour or something, but you seem to be a pretty cool, well-rounded person, which is, oh, which is thanks. great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know whether it's, you know, I guess who knows whether it's the right journey for everyone to take, mm-hmm. but you know, it's, it's certainly, um, I, I would love to hear, I know we've kind of chucked a piano to the side of you. I've seen some video of you playing piano and you're a beautiful piano player. Was there, is there any chance we could just, I don't know, just like get a, yeah 60 second just something because it's um and we don't do piano stuff in guitar videos very often here let me hold that can i can i also for this section if i mess up can i do it you can do it as many times as you like absolutely so i'm like really rusty like you don't (laughs) understand how rusty i am Great, honestly. Was that okay? It's beautiful. Okay. It's it's it honestly is. I think the <coughs> the piano is. Uh, I think it's the greatest human invention it's, of everything. I'm gonna go on camera saying this. I think piano is the best instrument. I yeah. I think as a songwriting tool, it it kicks guitar's ass. No offense, guitar, but I think it's just the fact that it's linear. It makes like yeah. polyphony so much. Like it makes it make way more sense. Like you have like your lower, I actually think view the fretboard the same way as I view piano. Um, 
like the lower keys are like your left hand, so like your accompaniment, and right. then like you, your right hand is generally like the lead melody. Yeah. But you can obviously switch and flip and do crazy crossover stuff. But I think like yeah, it just makes it way more easier to write full parts. I, I'm I the, the only thing I think guitar completely wins. <laughs> is you look so much cooler when you're playing, not just you, just guitar players, just, you know, the, the, my, I think the <laughs> one thing that I've always struggled to really like wanna be a piano player is when you see someone and they, and they, they basically have to sit down to play or even if they, you know, do a bit Jerry Lee Lewis kind of stuff. Yeah. I still kind of, I still think, you know, the guitar is just, it's got a, so much more visually interesting and the fact that you can kind of run around with it and you can make crazy faces oh, and do course. big string bends and stuff like that. That's so, why they made the keytar. So yeah, can, but that's the yeah. that's like the least cool thing of oh, all what? time. I yeah. think it's the coolest <laughs> Really? Thing. Yeah. You're just in these like 80s new romantic bands, aren't you, playing your keytar? Um, <laughs> you know uh, who looks cool playing piano is Hiromi. She right, looks, uh, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, she's got this like cool hair and she's just, like super into it. I don't know, like if check out who, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. It's like okay. Hiromi Uhara, Uhara. she's okay. Japanese. She's amazing. But Well, we will, <laughs> we will find out. Anyway, look, let's talk about gear. Let's nerd out on gear. I think we've gone deep enough with Sweet. music. Um, and by all means, if, you, if you've got time, you can stay for lunch and we'll go even deeper about music. But for this particular <laughs> video on our highly superficial YouTube gear channel, uh, let's just talk about, now the Ibanez Tallman, which um, for reasons, I don't even know why, pr presumably a lack of popularity, is currently not in the Ibanez electric guitar catalog. You can only get that as an acoustic or as a bass, and yet, You've got this badass looking best color guitar I think oh, we've seen thanks. all year. <laughs> How did you come to, to start playing the, the Tolman? Well, um, my relationship with Ibanez began, I'm trying to think, how did I even start playing them? I guess they, they wanted to get in touch. So they, uh, my, my artist rep guy, Mike, he, mm -hmm. he suggested for me to try out a Tolman. Um, Cause I started out playing tellies mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, Actually, the first Talman I got was a, was a Tele style. Um, yeah, I've seen. So it's slightly one. different bridge and just the two pickups. Yeah, it had like, yeah. I think it was Bill Lawrence pickups in it. Cool. Um, and I, I really, I like those pickups so much from my Tele that I, I cannibalized them and I put them in the new Talman. Mm. That's my pink sparkle one, if you've ever seen that I've one. not seen that, but it's, uh, I can imagine. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful guitar. Um, and then what really, I've played like Fenders before and they're great guitars, like classic. But what really, really made me fall in love with the, the Ibanez Talman is the wizard necks that like yep. uh, Ibanez has. They're just so thin and flat and it makes like playing technical things way yep. easier. Like I feel like I fly on these necks and on a Fender neck it feels a little bit more cumbersome. Yep. In addition to that, um, I have a broken finger. Oh, it's like super broken. when did you do that? I tripped and the story behind that is it didn't heal right because uh, I had to do a piano competition the next week. So I still practiced and did it with a broken finger. and. Uh, yeah, it's disgusting. It makes a clicking sound. It, <laughs> uh, if you want to like mic that, like broken bone ASMR. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, is this, does this, I've just realized, it, but it, the good thing is it's, it's bent the right way, hasn't it? Because if it was bent the wrong way, you, yeah. you've now got like an extra sort of Crazy inch on the, on the reach. Yeah. You? So, uh, you know, if you're looking for more reach, just snap that sucker. I'm just kidding. Don't. Don't do that, kids. Bad idea. Um, no, it's actually quite annoying because it'll lock up live and oh, I'll have to man. sometimes like unclick it. Sorry, it's disgusting. No, it's fine. I'm pretty um, queasy at the best of times. But anyway, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess, you know, it makes it uh, like having a thin neck is yeah. much gentler on yeah. my broken freak hand. So, um yeah, I guess that's why I really like Talman. And then um, I got acquainted with Seymour Duncan. Um, yep. And I remember I f started playing their, this is a 5-2 set, the mm -hmm. Strat configuration one. Um, and I I had to borrow a guitar at NAMM. So I went to Ibanez, I was like, I need a guitar. And they were like, okay, we got you one. And they gave me this beautiful sunburst one with these pickups in it. And then oh, I cool. played it and then 
um, I really enjoyed it. And then Mike was like, why don't you just keep it? So I, I brought it home and I just started writing so much music on it. And it was, uh, it was crazy, just like song after song after song. And I, I realized that the tone was just really inspiring. I, I think it's, I mean, it's funny because I, don't, I, don't, I, can't, I can't really decide what it is that would make it you know, the, the, I guess maybe Ibanez are not synonymous with guitars that have a kind of a 60s vintage kind of vibe to them. And mm -hmm. this is definitely going after that sort of Jaguar jazz mastery yeah, kind the of. Body. Off, yeah, yeah. So I kind of get that. Maybe it's just right guitar, wrong brand name or something for, mm -hmm. for some people. But I think it's cool. The color is wicked. Oh, I mean, I, we, I've shown you the pictures of those green sparkly strats yeah. that we had over the summer, but this is better. This is a better green sparkle. In fact, I'm definitely, we're going to use this video to try and reproduce this color on some <laughs> other guitars. It looks cool. Yeah. Um, but you, I mean, without you know giving too much away, is there potentially we might see something, maybe a tie up with you and Ibanez in the future? Who knows? Maybe uh, giving me that kind of like, might have to edit this bit out of the video look. If I told you, you'd have to wipe your memory. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and everyone who watches this yeah, video. Yeah, absolutely. Well, who knows? I think it's cool. And if, if it helps Ibanez, I think you should do it. I'm yeah. just saying. I, I think I, that's cool. I love this color. I feel like um, one of the complaints I remember that reading from a lot of people is that they just thought the Tommen wasn't available in an interesting enough color. I think they just have like yeah. a solid white. Like yeah. when I go on Reverb, I see like mostly it's like, you know, that, that cream colored one. Maybe um, that's the issue. Maybe it's just they've got to go, look, it's a Fender-y kind of vibe shape, but yeah. the colors just depart. Don't do like old school colors from the 60s, you know. Yeah. yeah there were some cool Fender colors then as well. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I think people do care about aesthetics mm. at the end of the day, especially if they're performing live. And I don't know, having something nice to look at when you play is Helpful too. I will say these sparkle ones photograph amazingly on stage. Just, I bet it. I bet it looks great in the video. Is the pink sparkle? Are you say it's a telly? Is it the pink sparkle? Yeah, it's a telly, and, and it's is a, it the same kind of multicolor pink as all? It's I think one type of pink, but the the sparkle, the actual glitter size is bigger. Right. So it's like a chunkier, like a flaky. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you see like the layers. It has it. dimension dimensionality. Is that a word? Dimensionality. It is. Now. I feel like that's like a Jen yeah. song or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a new periphery album, yeah. Dimensionality yeah. Uh, 4. Yeah, um, 4. Yeah. 4.3. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So again, this is all such a sort of a, I don't know, like a, a juxtaposition for the sort of style of music and everything. Why why would you use an AC-15? An AC, not why, because it's a great sounding amp, but it's like, it's like <laughs> it, I don't know, it's, I'm loving the blend of things old and things new and stuff. So tell us about how you, how you started using Vox amps. Uh, well, I started playing on a deluxe reverb, which is cool, but I think it at the time lacked some headroom I needed. Um, so then I bought a Vox amp, and I also just really okay. So my first amp ever was an AC4. Okay. It's like a tiny, yeah, yeah, but it's a tube amp, so yep. I, I, got, I got spoiled like immediately. <laughs> um, I just really enjoy the interaction between these pickups in particular and the tubes. Like I can get such nice breakup on a clean tone just from like. Um, if I dig in a little more, mm. um, I can get it to break up. But if I like lay back, that's why I also love playing with my fingers is because like I feel like I have more control over tone, yeah. which is something that I take from my piano days as well. Um, but yeah, I just, I really, I, I really like um, how you can get really nice chimey cleans. But then like if I like want to do like yeah. a heavy section, even if I have a, like sometimes I'll have like a gain pedal I'll slap on mm -hmm. and it like pushes it even more. So it's just, this is nice. It's a great tone. And then finally then, pedals wise, and we, we got to love pedals. How many pedals have you got? You said you had a big collection of pedals at home. I don't even know. I don't. What, we're talking that big? Are you, you're like over a hundred or something. I, I don't want to like, I'm not trying to like <laughs> brag or flex. Like I certainly don't think like, I don't know. I, I, I got a lot of them because I do demos sometimes, so people will send sure. me things to demo. And um, I still have a few I have to get around to. It's just I'm never home, so it, it's really difficult. But I have quite a few pedals. I have like a shelf. Um, That's great. And I really enjoy organizing the shelf by a type of pedal. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> You're I don't like know. OCD. <laughs> I, I'm not even OCD. I just like, I think I like, um, like if I need something, fa if I'm in the moment, I'm writing a song and like this needs, uh, a chorus vibrato, 
I don't want to have to like look for hours for my. I want to just know which shelf. You could, if you if you really makes you you can sort our pedal display out because it's totally random at the moment. So if it would make you feel happy, yeah. by all means, <laughs> you know, put them into some sort of order. But so what we've got here, we've got a drive pedal, a compressor, a delay, and some modulation and some and some reverb and delay, I guess here. So oh sorry, some some reverb. What's the what's the absolute kind of desert island? pedal board for you? Uh, well, I guess I haven't tried everything, so I, I, I don't I don't know yet. It's just the pedal market is mm. so crazy saturated. Like I feel like there's just like so many of the same type of pedal. <clears throat> but the ones that I have that I love on my yeah. board, um, I love that Julia. <coughs> that's, that's what I meant. Rather than the specific pedal, what, what the, you know, <coughs> is, you know, could you just not live without modulation or not live without oh. reverb or which one would be the... That that Julia yeah. um, chorus vibrato makes me just write yeah. like really, I don't know, it sounds like the police or something. I just write like super indie sounding things on it. And then um, I guess uh, I really like the Fathom, but my I'd say my favorite reverb is a Mercury 7 by Maris. Oh yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. so beautiful. I wish yeah. I had it with me so I could demonstrate it. Um, Overdrive. I, I do like the Zvex box box of rock. That's okay. like a Dane pedal. That's real I, fussy, isn't it? The yeah. box of rock. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Mm. I like that. Okay. But it's just like you can like customize how much you want. Um, I like the long sword. Uh, electronic audio experiments is, is just my friends. Yeah, we should YouTube. give them a shout out and we'll yeah. we'll put links. <laughs> this is not one that uh, yeah, Anderton John. sells, but it sounds cool. It looks cool. Yeah, it's great. It's got built in an EQ, so mm -hmm. it's great. Um, uh, let me think. For delays, I have an avalanche run that I love. That's cool. Yeah. It's got the swell setting, which is nice because then it delays mm -hmm. the attack and it's like beautiful for like just single note things. It's just like really delicate. I got the carbon copy deluxe, which I love and I use on a lot of my songs. Um, I used to have a Supapus, but unfortunately. Oh, the, uh, way huge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that one as well, but unfortunately it broke on tour. Have so. you tried? We may probably haven't got time in this video to see this. Have you tried the Walrus, um, I'm going to say slow, and it's not the correct pronunciation because oh, there's like an to. umlauf or whatever you call it across there, schlo or something, I think it is. That, Pete will know because it's his more his language than mine. But that's the heavy reverb with sort of modulation within it. And it's again, it's another one of those oh. super inspiring... <laughs> You have got one. I feel I feel silly now because I did a demo for it, but right. I just don't. I don't own one, but I, I would own one yeah. if I if I uh, if I could. Um, yeah, I love that pedal. Another one that I, I just thought of is the uh, Caroline Audio Somersault. I saw that was on your rig rundown with um, Premier Guitar, wasn't yeah, it? We talked about that got, a lot. Like every setting on that thing is great. There's some pedals where I feel like, um, I mean. There's some pedals where I feel like certain settings are melodic settings and other settings are just if you want to generate noise. And so <laughs> if you boil it down, there's really only two like usable settings for right. like writing a song. But like it's it's all cool. But I feel like that Caroline Audio um, Somersault one, every setting is just like perfect, like beautiful. Well, I must admit, I enjoyed nerding out with pedals with you because not everyone's a pedal nerd, but I, I'm, I'm, I do like it when we get a pedal nerd on the show. I don't even think I'm an expert. Like a lot of how I approach pedals, I was admittedly intimidated at first because right. I'm like all these buttons and knobs, like what do I do? But I think the way I work is there's some pedals that are like, you have to read the manual to figure out because yeah. like they're like Rubik's cubes. Like you press two buttons and it unlocks a secret setting and then it opens <laughs> up and then it transports you to another dimension. And like, you know, it's like crazy. But some pedals are more like straightforward. Like yeah. I even have a fuzz pedal. It's a germanium fuzz and it's just one knob and it's sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like when I think about pedals, uh, well, first of all, going back to my main point was that I just learned a lot of it by trial and error, mm. playing something, maxing out the knob, seeing what that knob does, like really using my ear to yeah. to figure it out. Um, I think that's where <laughs> old style pedals like this are just have got the edge over digital because mm -hmm. the idea of going into a menu and just being confronted with four words like um, pre-delay, um, I don't know, I can't even think of, di yeah. like different parameter names that in isolation just don't mean anything. Yeah. And it's, comp you know, you just, I'm with you, you just want to plug the thing in and just go, what does this do if I just, oh, okay, there's a sound, I like yeah. that sound. And exactly. that's, it's so much easier to do with, with uh, you know, analog style 
pedal. Or not because they're not all analog, but just like oldie fashioned, mm -hmm. you know, just knobs and switches. Yeah, I have different boards. Like I have a live board, which is stuff that doesn't require so much coordination and like um, fine tuning and mm -hmm. like the secret setting stuff. You can get also a preset switch, which saves my life yep. for some stuff. But um, yeah, for I have a live board where it's like more straightforward, just like I can tweak a knob if I need to while I'm playing mm -hmm. if it's wrong. Um, and then I have a studio board, which is the more nitty gritty stuff. Right. Like, um, what's that? Uh, there's a company, uh, the one that makes the warp vinyl. Um, Ch Chase Bliss. Chase Bliss. They have yeah. a lot of really yes, they do amazing stuff, and I think they're great too. Even the Maris stuff. Like, I have an Autobit Junior. We, we are the worst. Andertons is officially <laughs> the worst YouTube channel ever for doing <laughs> Chase Bliss demos because we do. We plug the things in and go right. What does this do? And it's like you end up going. Oh, I don't even think we've scratched the surface here. And then you look, you read the manual, like what yeah. it can do. Yeah. And you just go, oh my god, we're never going to get through all that. So yeah, yeah. it's it's that's for proper. Um, shoegazy kind of yeah. stuff, isn't it's it? A so. Great studio tool because, like, if you don't have the time to do that live, like, if you really want to sculpt your tone, like, in a in a studio and really fine tune mm -hmm. it to what you want, like, I think that sort of stuff is really useful. So I have a whole separate board that I use just for like when I'm recording. This is awesome. This is an awesome, <laughs> awesome conversation, which I feel bad about feeling like I'm going to have to wrap it up, oh, but I am. I could unfortunately. talk to you. Well, we, we <laughs> will. We'll carry on afterwards. But so what, what's happening in 2020? Well, actually, right now you're, you're just in Europe doing some clinics. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll have this video live by the time your clinics, uh, uh, um, in, the, before they're finished. So uh, uh, great if you've managed to see a bit on what, uh, well, uh, right now, but um, Assuming this video goes live, I guess, sort of, you know, in December sometime, what, what can people expect from you over the next few months? Uh, well, we're heading to the studio. Uh, my schedule is pretty crazy. I'm doing these clinics and I fly straight to um, Long Island. I recorded a studio called Voodoo Studios there. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be there for like a month. And then nice. I go to NAMM for a few days. And then I uh, go back to the studio and then I immediately go on tour. So... It's a uh, periphery and plenty, I think. So, oh, wicked. Yeah. Just in the States or are you going um, in elsewhere? The, in the States. Right, fair enough. Uh, love the periphery guys. They're really cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically studio time for me. Uh, it, it's funny because I, I literally finished, It's I think it's going to be 11 songs. I finished up the songs right before I left for this clinic. And then uh, all the guitar parts are done. I sent it to my band and they're currently writing their parts. We're not going to hear what it sounds like until we reconvene at the studio and, and jam it out. Yeah. So it's a bit tense, but I have faith in my guys. <laughs> oh, well, look, if you've not heard any of Yvette's stuff, again, I'll put a link in the description below. There's some beautiful music. Uh, there's there's a, a piano album, there's guitar music, um, band stuff. I mean, it's, it's very, very cool. Very, very cool. And it was great to meet you. Thank you very much for taking the time to come in. You've done an amazing job of getting through uh, an hour despite the fact that you're jet lagged to pieces. <laughs> no worries, coffee, yeah, coffee. coffee has helped. <laughs> but yeah, thanks a lot. It's really, really cool to be coming in. So there you go, everybody. It's a bit young. <laughs> Inserted uh, canned applause. <laughs> All right, see you next time, everyone. <laughs>